All right. Good evening or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Neo4j online meetup. This is number 33 for those of you who are keeping count. And today we've got Mike, Mark, and Conrad with us. And they're going to be talking about breaking down enterprise data silos with Neo4j. And they're going to be talking about their tool uh, called Hopefully, I'm going to say this right. I think it's Menome, uh, or you can correct me uh, if it's wrong. Uh, so in case you've not been to one of these before, my name is Mark. I work in the NFJ Developer Relations team in London. And uh, there'll be code in this uh, in this talk, so you'll need to make sure your resolution is high enough so that you can see it clearly. Uh, on the bottom right-hand side of the YouTube window, uh, there's a HD button, it's the third button across. Set your quality to 720p or above, and then everything will be clear. This will be recorded, and it'll be on the same links. If you want to share it with anyone afterwards, you can do that. And if you have any questions, there's obviously the YouTube chat on the right-hand side of the screen. Or if you're on the DFJ Slack account, then you can ask us questions on there, and I will ask them off um, Mike, Mark, and Conrad. So with that, I guess uh, I'll introduce uh, introduce you guys, and maybe you can give us a, a couple of sentences on, your, on yourselves, what you do, uh, and how you got uh, into using DFJ in the first place. Sure. Thanks. No, we're really excited to be uh, be here, and um, and yeah, it's been a it's been a great and very exciting journey for us. Um, we actually started. Uh, I actually started working with Neo Four J um, a few years ago now. Uh, I think two thousand probably two thousand nine ish. Um, but it's been kind of a, a long uh, quest in terms of being able to try and um, to try and bring this whole thing to life. And just to give you a little bit of context, hopefully you can see this. Um, I actually started messing around with the idea of uh, messaging and knowledge management in 1986 with a bulletin board. So I'm kind of dating myself there. Um, but, and then starting in 2000, I was going through the process of trying to working in an engineering organization, trying to um, capture the knowledge associated with, with mining companies and whatnot. And Fortunately for me, though, I didn't end up, I wasn't crazy enough to try and write a graph database. Um, fortunately for me, Neo4j started up in 2001, and then basically around, uh, I was running into challenges trying to get this whole thing to work in about uh, 2008 or nine, and then came across Neo4j, thought it was awesome, started working with it a bit there, and then in 2015, we started up, uh, started thinking about getting Mino Technologies going, and we've been at it now for about two years. Uh, in terms of actively pursuing the development of uh, of the system, um, so that's a bit of an overview of that. Uh, and this morning, so what we want to talk to you about today is we want we really want to talk about this idea of uh, of the knowledge graph and how we're going about trying to harvest all of the rich knowledge that exists inside of, of enterprises. Um, and really, you know, to, to get to that point and to break down data silos that exist and to capture critical knowledge with um, with Neo4j. What we need, what I want to do is just kind of step back for a minute and as you can probably tell, we're from we're from Canada, thus the Tukes. Um, and what we want to do is kind of take you through a bit of the thinking that we've got behind this and the nature of knowledge in the enterprise. So the way we think about it and the term Minome, essentially the way that came about was recognizing the fact that corporations are essentially knowledge environments. and People inside of corporations, what they do is they'll actually go about naturally selecting the knowledge that is useful to them to get their jobs done. So this whole idea is uh, knowledge evolves inside of enterprises and changes in response to changing business conditions as people are going through the process of saying, yes, this bit of knowledge is quite useful for me. This bit of knowledge is useful for me. This bit of knowledge may not be. So knowledge evolves and changes and it's constantly in flux. Um, so the idea behind Minome is that we really want to try and capture the knowledge DNA, represent that, and be able to grab all of that um, to represent the, the entire scope of knowledge in an organization. So to get to that point, we need to kind of understand the, the aspect of the knowledge side of the equation. Um, and what that's all about is really there's, there's three parts to this. Um, you've got the idea of explicit knowledge. So that's knowledge that is well structured and can be captured or stored or is captured or stored. And that's kind of the stuff that you see above the surface. Then there's this, this notion of implicit knowledge, which is knowledge that is not written down or well structured, but it could be. 
And then you have the hard stuff. So this is the stuff we really want to get our hands on, but is, is much more difficult to capture. And it's only been fairly recently that this is starting to be possible to harness. And that's the tacit knowledge. So that's experiential knowledge that is gained through conversations, interactions, communities, um, and gained over the course of someone's career. So what we thought we'd do in the sense of being from Canada is take you through a bit of an example of, of uh, these types of knowledge to frame it up. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the mountains, and these, this is, uh, this is uh, um, Mount Temple near Lake Louise. And so I do a lot of mountaineering and whatnot, and obviously having the physical training is important in being able to mountaineer. But equally as important is you need to have access to the three kinds of knowledge to be able to be safe and to, to su succeed in these sorts of expeditions. So when we are summiting Mount Temple, it is pretty important to know the fact that when you're going up this, to the top of this mountain, there's a permanent, it's, it's high enough that there's a permanent uh, ice cap on the top of it. And what ends up happening is there's a cornice that forms that's overhanging on the one side. So when you're on the summit of this thing, you have to make sure you don't go to take a nice selfie photo or whatever on the far, uh, in this photo, uh, the far side of it. If you do that, you will fall through the cornice and drop about 10,000 feet straight down to the valley floor or more. Um, so this is an idea of explicit knowledge. You need to study the environment. You need to know what you're getting into before you go into it. Implicit knowledge. So this is Mount Edith Cavell up near Jasper, and it's another expedition we did a few years ago. Um, we had to take a different route due to weather. Early in the morning when we started this, the, you couldn't see the summit, so we came up a different way. Uh, the guidebook did actually not have this little bit of information about how there's about a three foot wide ledge between us where this photo was taken and the main summit. So that would have been a, a nice bit of knowledge to know before, you know, having that, having access to that knowledge. Now, fortunately, when this gets into the tacit knowledge side, these two individuals uh, who are my associates in the mountaineering side um, have a lot of experience in, in getting through the mountains. So we did have the equipment with us uh, required to get through that, that narrow bit. And of course, talking about tacit knowledge, um, when we did the heli drop on top of Mount Seven, this is in Golden, BC, not, uh, about three hours from Calgary. Um, this trail runs down the scree slope, you can see one of the riders there, and then down the valley floor. This kind of thing, you really want to have a mountain guide with you. So this fellow's a guy by the name of Scott Belton. Um, he's got a tremendous amount of experience in doing these types of expeditions, so we definitely wanted to have him along for the, for the ride, <laughs> literally. Um, so how does this relate to enterprise stuff? Um, well, what ends up happening is, in the world of explicit knowledge, this is typically your enterprise systems, your databases, modeling files such as category information management files or in, or in the oil and gas world would be seismic models, that kind of thing. Implicit knowledge, this tends to be fall into the category of files, documents, spreadsheets, email, or other things um, that haven't been completely, that aren't completely accessible, broadly speaking, or not well conformed. Tacit knowledge, uh, this, this is this communications more. So this is, there are things that are uh, shared through phone calls, through things like Slack, that we're now starting to be able to mine that, luckily. There are things like notes, whether they're written down in things like OneNote or whether they're written on paper. Um, and it also falls into things like standard operating procedures, a job specific exceptions and activity, that kind of thing, where you may have some of that written down, but the actual procedure a person uses when they're in the field or when they're doing a job is not the one that's actually written down. And those differences are rarely captured these days. Um, so we do like to use this, this, this is one of our uh, taglines, data is the new oil. We speak of it mainly in the context of employment here in Calgary and trying to migrate, you know, diversify the economy and whatnot. But it is also applicable in the sense of this idea that you know, oil in and of itself is not useful until you refine it. Data is the same that way. Data needs to be refined in order to be fuel for business. And what we found over the years is that uh, despite the advent of the cloud, the cloud has actually made this whole problem of data sprawl worse, more challenging. So you've got, typically I've found in my experience, you know, the, the organizations that I've worked with through my career, which are largely engineering, professional service, mining, oil and gas, environmental, and now architectural engineering consulting, um, they typically use between seven and 21 different systems to run their operations. And what that does is that causes these data silos to happen. And it happens on a couple of fronts where you've got both, you know, like an HR system has its own way of describing people for the, that are associated with the business. The 
project management system has its own way of describing the, the, the projects and so on. So what ends up happening is employees spend up to two hours a day, this is a McKinsey study, searching and trying to gather information you know, to do their jobs, to make decisions. So for every four people you got working, you got one searching for the thing that they need to do their, their jobs. So what we want to do is we really want to give people the ability to share their wealth of knowledge and expertise by enabling them to quickly and easily and effectively capture that knowledge. And our massive goal, if we can ever make it happen, would be to eliminate file folders because they drive me crazy. Um, so in terms of where we are on the spectrum, so really what you want to be able to do is you want to start, and this is why we started with the explicit knowledge stuff, we want to be able to mine the data out of the enterprise systems, the key bits of, key, key bits of knowledge to form the foundation of the knowledge graph. Um, so this is defining and create a sort of central model of this, which is a person is comprised of these properties. It's related to a project in the, in the project management sense. A person may be a project manager of a project, so you build out that graph model of that. And then the data bot framework that we've created allows us to very quickly attach ourselves to any number of different systems that may exist in an organization to extract those key bits of data out of them. Now, we're also now starting to go after the implicit knowledge. Now that we've got kind of that conformed dimensional platform uh, in place, people, projects, uh, and teams, you know, all that, all those bits of metadata, it becomes a lot easier then to start layering the files on top of that and the documents and the spreadsheets and then to use machine learning methods to hook all that up. Once we've got that in place, then we can start going after the tacit knowledge. And we've started this a bit. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to it. But really, in terms of our progress on this whole thing, we're about here. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is turn it, or we'll stop for a second for questions, if there are any. No, we're good so far. All right, so let's jump into some real stuff here. And what I'm gonna do is I'll turn it over to Conrad, and he's gonna tell you about how we're harvesting, harvesting the explicit knowledge side of the equation. Okay, hello everybody, my name is Conrad. I joined Mike, I wanna say about a year and a half ago, when we were starting to build the actual UX for the data link, and like we mentioned, the starting point for our story was sort of trying to figure out how to gather explicit knowledge and represent all of that in the graph so that we can surface it to people that might need it. So our entire story around here is basically we need to take knowledge from all of these different disparate systems that represent data in a different way and put it in the graph. So we've come up with our own sort of pattern, our own story for doing that, and I'm going to take you through that. Uh, Basically, at a glance, this is what it looks like. We have a bunch of source systems over on the left side. So that can be, in this case, an accounting system, a CRM system, an HR system. We build what's called a bot for each one of these. And these bots sit on the network. Uh, they're little containerized node applications. And they communicate with the source system. They have a bunch of custom logic written on a persistent basis. And they interact with a RabbitMQ message queue. So when the bot pulls data from the source system, it creates these update messages, which go on the queue. They get fed into a central update queue, which then gets fed to another bot, which we call the data refinery. And that translates these bits of data into updates to Neo4j. So uh, we'll get more into that. But first, just a quick rundown of the bot framework. Bots are nothing more than small containerized microservices with a standard way of talking to them. So they operate over REST and AMQP. They can be triggered by webhooks. We can scale them. We can programmatically and remotely control them. They're malleable. They're just really handy. So probably first question here is, if we are splitting these things up and we're trying to harvest data from data sources, how should we go about doing that? We got really frustrated with long running ETL processes that would essentially grab all of the data from the source system in a big dump run for maybe days at a time. And if they got interrupted, you'd have to rerun the entire thing. They were also brittle. So if data changed in the source systems or you needed to update your data warehouse model, it would be a ton of work to go in and revise it. So we came up with a message pattern for carrying along what we call atoms of data. So these messages are JSON blobs. One message represents one data object from one source system and all of its first degree relationships. So you can sort of visualize it like this little graph pattern here, where this message has the red node, all its information, and stores the fact that it's related to orange and blue. So the idea here is that we mine source systems. We break all the data in those source systems up into atoms. 
And when we send those atoms across the wire, they will combine and make a complete picture in Neo4j. So the message structure itself looks something like this. You do not have to worry about actually reading this. What you really need to know is what's in this red box here is essentially the nucleus of this atom of data. And it contains everything that we can form on for the prime data object it represents, and a bunch of properties, where it came from, what its priority is, a bunch of other metadata. What's in the yellow and the purple are first degree connections from this data object. So in this case, we're representing Conrad Oust, which is me. We're representing that I'm located in, in Minom Victoria, which is our satellite office, uh, and that I worked on a project called The Link. So this down here is what it should look like when it's actually merged into the graph. Now, if you ignored everything I said up until now, this is what you should pay attention to. The core fundamental of how we ingest explicit data into Neo4j is essentially we break it down into atoms, we send it to a refinery, and we make one merged graph structure by linking all the atoms together. All right. So now I'm actually going to go through and we're going to have a short demo on how this actually works. So I'm just going to minimize this guy. We're going to get this guy out of the way. OK. So I have a terminal connected to my computer right here. You might need to zoom this in a little bit if you can. OK. Yeah, that's cool. OK, data bots. So uh, I actually have just in here a couple sample JSON messages. So this is sort of what you saw before. This represents one data object. This represents me. I'm an employee. And this is supposedly from our HR system, which tracks that I'm in Mino Victoria. This is one data message. And you'll notice we have a refinery queue open in Rabbit. We have our stack is running right here. We can actually go to the queue and manually paste this message in. Yeah, this guy. We don't need this right now. Here we, go. we can publish this guy. So our refinery is actually talking. It's running. It says there's success for an employee message for Conrad X. I also have the graph running right here. We have employees. We have Conrad Oust. And I work in Mino Victoria. So a couple of things to note right here. My preferred name, according to our accounting system, or our HR system, is the Chazinator. Uh, so we have all of my information right here. I am known as the Chazinator. I work in Mino Victoria. Mino Victoria has no further information. It is pending a merge. And that is because. We have more information. So our HR system has a view of me. Our accounting system also has a view of me. And in our accounting system, I'm known as Con. So this would be a message generated from a different data system. And we can actually publish it in. See that we have success for our employee message once again. Go into the graph, rerun the query, and our accounting system was higher priority than our HR system. So now my preferred name is Khan, and we still have our relationship. But now we have a new relationship because our accounting system has tracked that I have worked on a project called The Link, which is now also pending merge. So if we go back here, we have another message for merging in data for the office node that's part of our HR system, and one for merging in the project node that's part of our accounting system. And we can actually bomb both of these in. I've got a question for you from the chat. Yes, go for it. Uh, which is, where and how does data G duplication happen? So I guess you showed three different versions of yourself, so maybe this is. OK. Um, 
So essentially, the assumption for our refinery is we'll have conformed dimensions for all of these different things. So at the very least, we can get sort of an object in and say, according to this source system, this object exists with this unique identifier. Uh, if we have disparate systems and there's nothing we can use to match on them, we'll ingest both and they'll both exist in the database. And we actually have bots further down the line that we can use to deduplicate or to dedupe the different nodes. Yeah, and our plan there is to use a combination of uh, things like the, uh, the phoneme in APOC uh, algorithm to detect those duplicate, duplicate, potential duplicates and then use a combination of that with the bots. Uh, so if we can figure out that there's a, a match above a certain probability threshold, either using that or the Levenstein distance kind of a thing, then we can instruct the bot to do the merge on those down on those nodes. Or what we can do is we can take the bot and say, OK, the bot isn't sure that this thing needs to, is a duplicate, but it, it, it's likely one, and then send that message back to this, the system administrator through the admin console that we're putting together that then will allow the system administrator to take action on that and merge those those two records down into a single record. Yeah, ideally we want to build a GUI for these sort of, we think these are the same, but we need human intervention and have it sort of crowdsourced to people that are actually browsing through the data. So it'll be a combination of machine learning methods to help augment people's capability to then clean up the data using, a, using a, you know, the things that both of those aspects do well. So people... So would you do that well, you it's already imported, or you do that like in the, in the pipeline somewhere? That's when it's imported. So this framework that we have right here for harvesting, that's essentially to get as much data out of the source systems in kind of a one-to-one -one fashion. And then down the line, we have analytics and refinement and all that sort of thing. Yep. Cool. On the import side, though, we do have a priority system. So if there is duplicate data, like uh, Conrad's preferred name there, yeah, uh, we we have systems for deciding which of that data is a source of truth. Yeah, I've played with the Python tool called Dedupe a little bit. I don't know whether you've ever seen that one. That one attempts to do like some sort of deduplication <laughs> by doing active learning, where it um, it builds like a bunch of features, like for example, n-grams based on like the different parts of the words and different and the, obviously you can give it different fields and then. Uh, if it's unsure, it, it passes it uh, to you and asks you to label it, uh, whether or not the, the records are the same or not. I'm wondering whether you've seen that, because uh, it kind of sounds a little bit similar to what you're, you're doing. I haven't seen that. Nope. That's, uh, that's it would be, yeah. yeah. That's, so that's something what we would do with something like that is encapsulate that into a bot and then have that running against the graph um, cool. as the framework. Mm -hmm. They sound like smart people, though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, I'm going to bring it back to this. So essentially, the result of all of these messages, it's four distinct messages from two distinct systems. And what it's given us is this nice little graph structure. Nothing is pending emerge. We have all our properties. We can now see the budget for the link. And uh, everything's kind of hunky-dory with that. So that's just the result of hand-bombing messages into RabbitMQ. And obviously, we've sort of automated this. So I've actually built. Uh, sort of a demo bot. So this is a harvester bot, just as you'd sort of see in a corporate environment that you'd write for a CRM or an HR system, except this one goes to a nice little service called JSON Placeholder. So JSON Placeholder is a set of fake data, mostly full of lorem ipsum, with some correlated IDs between all the different types of data that it surfaces. So I built this little bot. I can now run. It's written in Node.js. And when we deploy it to production, it sits inside a Docker container. So if I run this guy, it sets up, it listens on port 3000 or whatever port you configure it to. And it connects to RabbitMQ, creates its channel, and sits idle. So uh, that guy is now running. We can bomb back over here and We can just do a git on the root of this thing. So if we hit this thing via the web, we get a JSON response. And it's basically a full description of this bot and everything that it does. And these are the web hooks that it surfaces. So we can see that we have a slash status endpoint to get the current status of the bot, whether it's running a sync job, what it's doing, if it hit an error. Uh, there's also 
a sync endpoint, which we can send a post request to. And that'll run a full sync of our REST endpoint, in this case, JSON placeholder, through the harvester. So what that looks like is we send a post request, sync. We go, and it says starting the REST harvest. So over here, we can see the refinery is going nuts. Um, we have on the harvester side, we can see that it's pulled posts, users, comments, albums, photos, and to dos. It's generated all those messages and it has put them on the rabbit queue. So currently, we can see we have about 5,000 messages. We're only processing one at a time because this is running on my dinky little laptop. Uh, so is the book, is the book is the bot reading each of those messages and then uh, doing, doing something with each of them? Yes. Uh, it's actually sure. translating them into, uh, where did we have that? Let's see. Uh, basically, this format. We actually have a strict schema for the messages that we send across the message bus. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a data agnostic representation of we have, how do I get that presentation back? That's down, that's down here somewhere in my list. I'm not a Mac user. Just behind the there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, so things like this, or rather things like this. Each JSON sure. message one of these little atoms, and we essentially translate them into a format that's data agnostic for ingestion. And then the refinery translates them into graph updates. Cool. We've got, a, got another question <coughs> for you as well, uh, which is, do you keep track of the events and the order they were received in the graph so that you could rebuild it from scratch uh, or work out the, you know, where the data came from, like the data provenance of each of the items? Uh, very good question. Mm -hmm. So we do keep track of where the data came from. We keep track of every source system that is provided every property. Uh, and with regards to the data and the order in which it's ingested, that actually doesn't matter. So essentially, like we have this queue that we're processing through. These atoms of data can arrive in any order, and they will build the same graph structure. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think they're a bit delayed, so I guess we'll find. I think I, I think it probably does, um, but I guess we'll find out. Uh, another question, following on from that, is: Do you uh, ever have a process where you want to extract data out of the graph? For example, uh, dump the data into a Flatter report or yeah, something like that. Yeah, we can talk about that. That's uh, that's a big one. Um, right now, we um, we don't have a, a bot automated on that front as yet, um, but certainly one of the things that we want to try and do, and we'll show you a bit of the UX we've got so far, um, that is absolutely on our roadmap in terms of being able to say, I would like to have this thing, you know, this this bit of, this atom of data plus this atom of data plus this atom of data, and then generate that out to an output. And the way we're looking at doing that is basically allowing somebody in the user interface to select the cards and the properties associated with the cards um, that they would like and then sending that off to a bot that will then run a, a Cypher extract and push that out to whatever the net resulting format is going to be, presumably CSV or Excel or something like that, because that's the ones that we get asked for the most. Yeah. Uh, Neo4j is really good at enabling us to do that, too. Fantastic. Uh, cool. So this might seem convoluted, uh, but we actually get a lot of benefits. Like I said before, this was actually born out of frustration with uh, traditional ETL processes. So benefits of this harvester message data atom thing that we've built uh, is, number one, it's durable. So the harvesters can go down. The message queue is durable, so it can go down. Uh, graph updates are tiny and atomic. So that means if Neo4j dies, since it's ACID compliant, your database is still going to be in a usable state. And on the refinery side, if it dies in the middle of a transaction, the database will be rolled back and recovered. And basically, you can spin up the refinery, and it'll just keep pulling from the queue like nothing can, nothing happened. So data ingestion can be aborted and interrupted and paused and whatnot at any level without any sort of loss. 
Uh, the bots are extensible. Like each of these bots is generally less than 300 lines of code. If you're interfacing with something really simple like a REST API or you're just translating one-to-one -one from SQL tables, like you do not need a lot. Uh, and because of that, they're really simple. So with the bot framework, we wanted each of these to be tiny, do one thing, and do it well. And therefore, it's really understandable, easy to extend, et cetera. So that's kind of the story of how we harvest explicit knowledge. And I'm going to turn it over to Bark, and uh, he's going to talk about harvesting implicit knowledge. Uh, should we pause for questions there? Uh, I think we're good so far because people are asking them, uh, ask them in between as well. And, and just on that front too, so we have put together an NPM uh, module for the bots and a, sort of a foundation for them as well. Um, you know, in terms of being able to enable other developers, our goal with that is to be able to get a developer up and running very quickly, basically to have everything they need to start developing these things within five minutes, and then be able to. Uh, you know, give them the maximum lift that we can in terms of being able to create something uh, quickly. And we have done some uh, work on that front in terms of one of our clients um, had a developer that we enabled with this whole thing. And he was a sysadmin. Yeah. He wasn't a developer. He was a sysadmin, but a smart guy. So he was able to get up and running with this thing in about five hours, uh, working through the whole process from nothing to he has a, we have a running bot that can harvest data out of their intranet system, for example. And we're going to continue to improve that as, as we get more and more people kind of wired into this. Okay, we've got a question. Right, so I'm going to take we've got a question for you just before you start that. Uh, just as uh, so, the question is: How do you handle malleability, and what does that mean? Malleability. Oh, you mean uh, in the context of data evolution? Um, I assume so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's that's actually one of the things we, we really like about the way this has gone is. Um, over the course of the year that we've been uh, building out and deploying this this uh, the system at, at uh, the various clients, um, one of our goals with it is to make it make sure that it is adaptable, uh, can evolve it with respect to changing business conditions, and so on. So one of the beautiful things about Neo4j is that of course uh, it is quite flexible. So that gives us tremendous flexibility, and then our framework we're uh, kind of bringing that up into that world as well. So one of the things we can do with the bots is we can tell the bot, hey, if you're talking to this REST service and a new bit of data pops in or something changes, just accept that. So you don't actually have to explicitly code, I want this property, this property, this property, this property. You can actually tell the bot to say, grab all of the properties that exist on this thing and bring them into the message structure and then fire them into the graph. So if somebody adds something new or changes the way something's set up in one of the source systems, the bot will just adapt to that and add it to the graph on the other side. Uh, without breaking into the ETL structure. So that's one way we're handling the malleability aspect. The other, as Conrad has said, is when we're using these things, these little, you know, each bot does one thing, does it well. If we need to add something else into the process because it's message oriented, we can have another bot pick up on either this, the same queue or a downstream message queue and take additional actions on that. And Mark will talk, give you some examples about how that works in this next bit here. So we can actually add new processes and processing steps into the equation uh, to do other things with the data as it's flowing through. Does that answer the question there, then? Um, I guess we'll, I, I think it was fine. Yeah, but I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wait. Uh, we can just continue, and then if there's a, another question, we can just uh, answer that later. Sure. Uh, I'm going to talk about implicit knowledge a little bit here, and that's data that can be recorded, but it's not in a standardized format, so a computer can't utilize it. Uh, whereas explicit knowledge is like an Excel sheet, this would be like a report that a human has to read, and then they take the information out of the report, and then they can use that to inform future models and their future work process. Yeah, it's like data that could be in, ex in an explicit like CRM system, but isn't. Yeah, and it evolves too. Uh, as we start to record this more and more, stuff becomes explicit data, and it all moves down the chain. So uh, we use probabilistic topic modeling uh, to generate uh, topic models that we can classify new documents against. So the way that works is we start with a set of documents called a corpus. Uh, and that's just any set of documents. And we break it down. And then we use unsupervised machine learning to generate a list of topics that represent the contents of the training corpus. 
Uh, once we have this model, which is a graph itself, we can take a new document, look at all of the words in that, and model it against the same corpus, and we get a probabilistic distribution of what topics it relates to. So in this example here, you can see the first two topics have words related to planes and ships, and the plane user manual has a very good correlation between that and the first topic. And then the cooking for dummies has a good correlation between the topic that the chef links up to. Um, what tools do you use for your unsupervised machine learning? Uh, we use LDA uh, topic modeling right now. Like uh, from try... any library, or are you ready yourself? Or... Oh, we're using Jensen for that. OK, cool. Uh, so to start off, we wanted a very wide breadth of topics. So we just chose the English Wikipedia. And we got 100 topics that are from women's basketball to science and technology. Women's basketball keeps showing up. Yeah, for yeah. some reason, every time we try and demo this and we click on a topic, it's the women's basketball tournaments one. Um, so that's really nice because we just have a really wide breadth of topics that we can model against. And the other cool thing is that if we get a smaller corpus that's not Wikipedia, say we have a corpus of just a bunch of structural engineering documents, we can bust that out into its own topics, and then we have a more directed model to model documents against. So the plan with this is we're kind of doing this in layers, where the, the explicit knowledge harvesting happens. That gives us a foundation. We then start bringing in the topic modeling and the machine learning part. We layer that into the, into the graph that's been, that's been constructed by the explicit data. As we're doing that, then we know, you know what we can wire the different topics up to the rel relevant projects and people through authors and whatnot. So you're kind of continually improving and, and augmenting the data set by bringing it together like this. All right. And again, this has been all put into the bot framework as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the idea of adding the topics to help people to search and find similar information, is that the plan? That, we're also, um, you know, the initial file crawler bot goes out and it's just, we are actually telling it where to go on the, within the giant file trees that exist uh, in these organizations. Our plan is to actually, as Mark has indicated, once we get enough uh, representative documents for structural engineering, for mechanical design, that sort of thing, we retrain the bot, then we open it up to run across the entire file store, and mm -hmm. it will tell us which documents should be classified and blow up the file store as opposed to us having to you know, explicitly tell it. So we're turning it back in over on its head. And the interesting thing, too, is since we can have multiple topic model graphs in the graph, we could have uh, one model for engineering documents and then another model for human resource type stuff. And then when we model a document, we can take the intersection between the two models and it gives us a more accurate model of what's in that document. Yes. Yeah. We'll show you a bit about how this works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where's our Neo4j? We have Neo4j. All right. Um, so. Yeah. Let's see if we can find women, women's basketball. I think it's the number six. Number six? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is kind of how it looks in the graph. We've got a topic, and if you can see down in the description at the bottom here, this one has basketball and FIBA and the NCAA and stuff in here. And topics link up to these words, that's these red nodes here, and they have a weight value on the link between the two of them that shows their affinity to that word. Uh, so then when we take a document in, it'll link up to, see if you can find a word that links up to a couple topics here. Dialect, surname. Yeah, anyways, uh, we get a list of topics that that document links up to with the probabilistic weight as well. So then we can say this, this document is 46% likely to be a structural engineering document, and there's a 10% chance that it's uh, electrical engineering document or something like that. Yep. And that pr probability is given to you by the LDA algorithm, is that right? Yep. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. So we, like Mike said, we have a bot that crawls uh, file trees, and it'll ingest these files and run the topic modeling on it. Uh, where that puts them, we're using Minio, which is an S3 compliant uh, file storage server. So essentially, we have this bucket set up with triggers such that when you uh, put files in here, it'll fire off events. So we're actually going to throw a couple documents in here. <laughs> there 
Oh, and we get a bunch of stuff from here. Yeah. I don't know. Scroll up a little bit there. We can show the nice little camera across. Oh, there she goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I deleted a few things before we started. Uh, we just added, as you may think, by um, Vannevar Bush. Yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have all of these downstream processes for we extract a thumbnail, we extract the full text, we get a checksum, uh, and then we send a message out on the queue, and our topic model spot kicks it out. So that's where you can see an example of multiple bots collaborating together off a single message mm -hmm. chain to then create a net result of, uh, of processing the files as they come into the system. And another interesting thing is we can put monitoring bots in this chain too. So we could say model documents against a legal corpus. And if we hit a certain percentage of likeliness to a specific topic, send that off to the lawyers because something bad has happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. we just tossed two docs in there. Let's see if that uh, did what we hoped it would. Yeah. yeah. So if we close this guy, we should get notes for files. So we have two notes for files. This is the, some API documentation. So if we look at, first let's actually look at the properties on here. So we actually have the full text of the file extracted and sitting on the node, as well as some other stuff like when it was last modified, what the file name is, uh, what the file size is, et cetera. And that gets, of course, picked up by the, the internal Lucene indexer in neo 4 j mm -hmm. Yeah. So. It's also automatically been categorized as these topics. So we actually get a weight value for each topic. So let's see. The highest weight value is for this HTTP documentation, software data HTTP app users. Here, expand that one up. Yeah, blow, blow the words out on that one. Yeah, OK. So triple W, users, mobile, computer, access, open technology. These are words associated automatically with this topic. And the really cool thing here is that, of course, it actually did link that up um, to the Ben of our Bush article from 1945 about uh, the Memex. Yeah, so that's a really great example of how this stuff is very, very powerful in that uh, you know, we've got a relationship between two very different types of uh, two documents that were written at very, very different times, uh, but have a relationship through their content. Yeah, so presumably you could search for documents by what the classified topic is, and you'd be able to find both of them starting at this node, which is our sort of technology node. Yeah, and we have implemented this at the architectural firm uh, in terms of automatically classifying their various engineering documents. Um, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's pretty neat stuff. Any, any questions about that? No, not so far. OK. Well, let's talk briefly about tacit knowledge and then go right into the link stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I find this, this, this sort of idea of like enhancing your data with, with machine learned data is a really interesting thing. So my, I, I, didn't, I, I, I can put a link for it in the chat, but my colleague, uh, Will Lyon, has been exploring with using, uh, like doing named entity extraction on, on the Russian Twitter trolls uh, oh. data set uh, to try and <laughs> figure out like what are, the, what are the locations and the different, um, People that people that that uh, people are tweeting about, uh, oh. and, and again, so it's got the raw data of Twitter, and then overlaid on it, uh, kind of the, the the named entities that you find from analyzing that text. And you could do the same sort of thing, I think, for uh, if you were using if you're in. The, so I think you guys are using Python tool chain. So you, NLTK, for example, allows you to pull out parts of speech. So you could easily add that sort of information on top of. Uh, Yes, uh, I mean, that's 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 well. I really like about the uh, the bot framework is the fact that we're language agnostic in that sense. So, because the messages are all you know running through an AMQP stack thing, um, and they're basically data you know datagrams, for like yeah. better describing them. I think that's perfect. Is it? Oh, hey, yay! Um, they we can actually have uh, Python. So the Python tools, they basically as long as they're you know accepting and firing off a message. We can have somebody write something in Python. We can have somebody write something in you know, JS JavaScript. We can have somebody write something in Go. You know, or you know, we could have a Java application acting as a bot too. Or even C sharp if you wanted to get real crazy with stuff. Or Lisp. Lisp. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, that's my new goal. Um, <laughs> right. So I got to write something in Lisp. I used to do a lot of Lisp programming at one time. You really did. 
Got to do something in Rust if you want to be proper hipster. <laughs> oh, yeah. How could we forget? Rust, of course. Um, so yeah, we'll just get into the tacit stuff here real quick. Um, so this is kind of the holy grail of the whole thing, and we are doing a bunch of work on this front or starting to. So the problem or the challenge here is that it's very difficult to capture. You know, it's it's um, unless unless Ray Kurzweil's singularity thing comes to fruition, you know, when we start downloading our consciousness into into machines, our only options right now really are trying to uh, go after as much as we can the sources where people are interacting at the edge of the information. So this is, and that's just one of the reasons we really like the idea of Slack, um, is that we can actually take, uh, we can actually create bots that, that sit in the Slack channels and do, you know, and take actions on that to pull, push and pull content back and forth from the, through the bot framework into the graph, or allow you to kind of search into the graph out of the ch Slack channels and whatnot and Slack's pretty nice in that way, in that you can actually have a definition of the various um, of what the channel subject is. So you know the channel subject, and in the context of an engineering firm, for example, professional services, you could have a channel that would be either a project or a site where work is done, which is typical in uh, AAC construction, oil and gas, and in uh, environmental industries, of which we've got clients in all all of those different verticals. Um, and then you know basically where this stuff is going on, you know, who's make, having the conversation. So there's a lot of really rich data there. Then we can bring the implicit machine learning stuff into the equation to help further classify that. And we do have a, a you know, a bot, he's a bit lippy right now. Um, so we need to do a little bit of work on making him a bit uh, nicer, but um, this does have a bi-directional search that uh, allows you to, to search things from uh, inside of uh, the application. Let's see if they can find me. Maybe. There we go. Person Mike Morley. You can see it's still pretty rudimentary right now. This is proof of concept. Um, the other thing we've got that is nice with the bots is if you want to report uh, something that's commonly done in these sort of uh, some of our clients is reporting hazards, for example. Um, the bot will step you through the process uh, of what's involved with this. I mean, everybody's, I won't spend too much time on this, but it is a pretty nice concept. Enter an area. Yeah, I don't think we need to go through all this. This is a very Canadian report. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so that's that's kind of that, and it will actually then fire the information into the, into the graph and whatnot. Um, and then we do have a UX side of the equation, um, which this is, this is an example data set that we put together from uh, merging a, a data set from the Alberta Energy Regulator on well locations, spills, and facilities, and the licensees or the companies that are associated with the same. Um, so this is one that we did at, um, at our meetup last week in terms of the analytics side. And this is kind of a simplified version of the user interface that we put together. Um, the thing that we... Uh, the thing we really like about Neo4j also is the fact that it essentially makes most of the data that we work with has a strong time component to it. It has a strong spatial component to it. So on the mapping side of the equation, um, so we definitely are harnessing the APOC uh, and the, the Cypher extensions for distance and whatnot uh, to make this work. Yeah, this is a collection of wells across Alberta and any spill events that happen. Yep. Uh, correlated with their licensees, so like oil companies and different firms like that. So you can see at this location here, um, there's a, there's a spill event that happened. There was a substance released associated with a licensee. Um, um, an energy spill, something. And this this organization then has a number of spills they're responsible for. It looks like there's a lot of produced salt. Um, you can see all the details of those spills. Uh, the other, you can bring more information on them. Um, so this is sort of our user experience around, we've got the information in the graph from whatever sources. This is how you would actually search it and navigate around through it. Yeah, and what we're doing is essentially a card. A card in this world is equivalent to a node in the graph world. Um, and then the, the cards are obviously connected together with relationships. So because, and then you've got many different paths with which to find something. You can find it through the typical full text kind of a thing. You can find it through navigating the relationships, or you can find it by firing off questions. So if we want to see uh, what wells, and these are essentially in behind the scenes, these are cipher queries associated with, um, that, that are triggered with this. So if we want to see what wells or what spills, 
There might not be any. There might not be any. I think there are for that one. Mm -hmm. um, those queries then will bring back data associated with that. You can also then run uh, queries off the graphs and the, the little analytics panels here. These are fairly simple, but they will bring back data associated with um, the different cards. So this is these are all the different events associated with salt, uh, produced water, um, that kind of thing. So and then you can also browse to these things by different aggregates. In this in this little demo guy, we've just got them sorted or collected by um, by their names in this case, just to make it you know easy to move around in. Um, so that's just a real quick tour of, of that side of the, the fence. Um, we also decided to have a little bit of fun. This was a great example that you published last week. So we took the data running out of that same database and ran it against uh, this one showing uh, crude oil events uh, with a heat map. And you can see this was obviously a fairly large event here. Um, so we can zap in on that. And it looks like uh, the Frog Lake spill, which was a big one a number of years ago. Uh, same thing, different type of uh, chemistry. This is salt produced water. Whoops. So you can zap in on that kind of thing. And again, this is where we really like uh, the graph database in this sense because it you don't then need to use you know a GIS for this kind of stuff. Um, so from a from a cost perspective, from a delivery of applications to the client perspective, there's a lot of stuff we can do here just in terms of having data bots that are analyzing the data in the graph and then delivering value back to the clients in terms of understanding the world uh, and all of that sort of awesomeness. Um, so any questions on that? I think we have about 10 minutes left, roughly. No, we haven't got any new questions so far. OK. Um, what else we got here? So I think that that's kind of the extent of the, the demos and whatnot. Um, cool. We're, we went faster than we thought. Good, OK. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, so I guess well, we'll give people a chance to come up with any other questions that you have. If you liked the talk, don't forget to like it on YouTube so that other people uh, have a better chance of finding it. Uh, will we? Do you want to post the slides of this somewhere? Or? Yeah, we'll put the we'll get the slide links set up. Um, cool. Then we can just add it if you just add it on the disc the comments of the the video afterwards. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I can take care of that. Okay. Sure. And this graph that you see here, we're 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 debating about putting this one up as well. Uh, so this is one we actually did do at the um, at the the meetup last week. Um, so we need to do a bit more work on it in terms of uh, you know making it a bit making it more usable and whatnot. Um, something we're kind of I guess an interesting challenge that we've got is right now we're using things like uh, we're actually using a graph method. To collect things together, so we're using this idea of an alphabet group, where we connect the different nodes together based on letters into into this sort of a, a metadata chain. That's how we're handling the, these collections of things. We do a similar thing with time. You know, we're using time trees. I haven't generated one for this this juncture, but um, to to be able to do things like, okay, show me all of the the, you know, the spills that happened on a certain date. Um, some of those methods, we're not sure if that's kind of the, the best way of approaching it. There's certainly advantages to this, um, but there's some disadvantages as well. Like it, it becomes a bit, it kind of clutters the graph a bit um, in terms of uh, you know you end up with these these collections of things that then make it a bit more difficult to to run the analytics across. Um, and that's something we're really starting to move into now, especially at the uh, at the architectural firm where. Um, we're mining time data out of their um, out of their project control system. So one of the things we really want to be able to do there is is have a graph set up. And unfortunately, I can't show you their graph um, as at this juncture. But uh, essentially, it's the kind of thing where you want to see. Hey, I really like working with Bob, but Bob's pretty busy. Who else is like Bob in the organization? Who has the same skills? Who's done work in a similar area? Um, what projects have these people worked on? So we're mining the time data out of uh, the project control system, and then using some of the, the algorithms to start to try and understand who works with whom, how often, what skill sets they have, looking for the clusters of people and whatnot around skill sets. Um, something else that industry has asked us for is they really want to start mining uh, insight out of their building information models. 
So we're setting up some bots or we're just in the process of starting to work on that where we'll have some bots that extract um, the commands that people actually are using to construct the various uh, modeling elements. And we'll also be mining out um, the structure of the models themselves. And we already know based on some studies that were done that uh, the idea with this is we want to try and make a model control, uh, air, air traffic control dashboard, which then gives you an indication on a dashboard like this the health of a particular uh, project. And the way that'll work is if we mine data out of, uh, out of a building information uh, management file, we've got the time data, and so we know basically how much work has been done in that project. And you can do things like if that building information management model has more than, uh, I think it's 60 or 70% roughly line, two-dimensional line work in it, and you spent, you know, uh, seventy percent of the budget. It's very likely that that project is going to run out of money before they finish the actual three-dimensional rendition of that model. So then we can provide the project manager with insight, saying, "Hey, you know, you're heading towards a problem here. The idea is to get away from lagging indicators and get to leading indicators, where we can actually help people, you know, prevent challenges before they run into them." So that's kind of a, a number of the other things we're starting to do now. What as we move up into the more tacit side of the knowledge, is you can go from just this, this sort of static reporting stuff into much more dynamic and forward-looking uh, insight. Yeah, the dashboard would also help the explicit knowledge side of things because when you do your giant data harvest using our harvester framework, you can really easily spot records and source systems that are incomplete or corrupt or whatever. So you'd be able to spot things like there were so and so many expected relationships or expected messages, but there wasn't proper referential integrity in the source system, or hey, these people don't have valid email addresses, or all these people are missing their last name. So you'd be able to use the dashboard as a health indicator for your entire organization's data. Are we back on camera? We are back on camera. All right. <laughs> So, cool, yeah. I've, got, I've got a couple of more questions for you. So, well, first one is more a comment uh, saying, this is very cool. So that's a, that's a nice one. We, and then got a, <coughs> so that's Dominique. So thanks to Dominique. Thanks. Next two questions are around whether people can make use of this. So do you have a beta release or any parts of it going to be open source? Any sort of? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> we're meeting tomorrow to start uh, to discuss that. Yeah. I want to make stuff open source. Yeah, we all want to make stuff open source. Yeah, uh, it's just we really have to discuss how practical it is to do so. Yeah, okay. We're trying to figure out the best path of doing that. Um, certainly, the the engine itself is uh, we're we've got our you know our initial clients are kind of up and running in the thing. We have to go back and do a little bit of cleanup to kind of we're actually rewriting the UX that I was showing you in React right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's currently written on Angular materials. Um, and we we're having some challenges with that. So we we are I think uh, probably about halfway through uh, refactoring that whole thing onto it onto the React stack, which is already proving to be much more responsive and a lot. It's going to give us a lot more flexibility. Yeah. Um, I think for the data bots, we we'd like to open source the core framework for that because yeah. if everybody's making these bots that all talk in the same format, it'd be much easier to. I want to do it because it's easier to deploy <laughs> if you don't have to hand around. You know, that too, we have to hand around keys. private keys right now, and that's a pain. So yeah. Yeah. we just open source everything. Then, yeah. So that's we are absolutely talking about that, um, and we're hoping cool. to get that figured out soon. Cool. I reckon. I reckon. Uh, pretty close to the end of the hour, so I reckon we could call it a day there. So thanks to Mike, Mark, and Conrad for presenting, and thanks to everybody who. Uh, who watched online and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much for setting this up and thanks everybody for tuning in. Cool. If you do have further questions, I guess let us know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Cool. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Cheers. Take it easy.